Well, good morning, Saints. It's such a, a joy and an honor to be able to bring forth uh, God's Word to you this morning. Um, so we are continuing our look in 1 Timothy, and we'll be getting into chapter 3 this morning, uh, honing in on verses 2 through 3. Uh, Pastor Brett will be going into verse 1 next week. And so the title of the sermon this morning is, What is a Pastor? Or you could use other words that we see in the New Testament, a bishop of, or overseer. The words are all synonymous. But we come to this question of what is a pastor, and what seems like forever this question was easy to be answered by most people in our culture. We look at our current context, and this question that was once quite easy to understand and answer has now become the grounds for controversy within Christendom. It's quite amazing to see the providence of God in action as we have studied through 1 Timothy. You contrast that with what we looked at last week, the Apostle Paul saying he does not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over men. And this very week, the SBC held their annual meeting. And you have this apparent majority saying that there needs to be a year-long study to figure out what the word pastor means. Because there are those churches, there are some churches within the SPC that have gone and ordained women to the role of pastor. Now their justification is that they're not the head pastor. And so somehow this is seen as, seen as okay within the SPC. Dear Saints, I will tell you this morning that this is absolute foolish disregard of the plain meaning of the text is why we must be ever vigilant to read and study our Bibles. If you look at the majority of mainline Christian churches that have now become unorthodox and affirm that which the Bible clearly defines as sin, their undoing began as they twisted the clear meaning of the text. They did so to fit their own desires. They did so to be pragmatic, to fit in with the crowd, to affirm the current cultural norms. The denial of the Scripture's authority is the beginning of the downfall of an institution that is in the kingdom. And an interesting note as well that one of the first outward expressions that we see of this is allowing female pastors, allowing women into roles that God has said they are not to be in. We see this in the Presbyterian Church USA. We see it in the United Methodists. We see it now also in the Episcopalians. This outward uh, movement of a female pastor is beginning with a denial of God's perfect and sufficient and holy word. So our study this morning of what is a pastor is an important one. And it is crucial in our day and age when so many refuse to accept the plain meaning of the text and the authority behind God's word. As Brett said, I hope that you don't check out if you're like, oh, I'm not going to be a pastor, or if you're a woman here this morning, don't check out. I encourage you to, to be a Berean, to study what these qualifications are, because they're important. Uh, we want to remain orthodox. We want to, as a body, uh, believe in the Word of God and follow what the Word of God says. And part of that is to pay attention to what the qualifications are of an elder is, or what is a pastor. We, we must be able to define that in a current state of chaos that we live in, where most people can't even define what a woman is. And so people may have questions and ask us, what is a pastor? So my encouragement for you uh, to take note. What is a pastor? So you may answer. So let us begin with reading. We're going to read 1 Timothy 3, uh, 1 through 3, and then we'll get into uh, our study. 1 Timothy 3, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. Not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. This is God's word. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you this morning 
to be fed by your word, to be instructed by your word, to be taught by your word. And so I pray, Lord, as we dive into what your word has spoken to us about the qualifications of an elder, Lord, that we would dwell upon these things. Lord, you have given your perfect and right design for how your body is to function, how the family is to function. And Lord, so we desire to seek your will in all these things. Lord, I pray that I would decrease and Christ would increase, that you would uh, let any uh, flagrant word of mine go fall on deaf ears, Lord, that only Christ would be seen in his glory, that we may be edified and lifted up. And we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we begin this morning, I want us to consider where we began back in chapter 1. We know that this letter was written to Timothy from Paul the Apostle. And in it we see Paul giving examples of proper conduct within the church. In the first few verses we see the charge given to Timothy to remain at Ephesus and to put an end to the false teaching that was taking place. And then we go on and we see this glorious gospel witness that Paul gives following with an encouragement to Timothy to wage the good warfare, holding faith in a good conscience. And then we find ourselves in chapter 2, and Paul urges Timothy to develop in the church a robust prayer life. That this prayer life would extend to all peoples, kings included. And then last week we began to look at the biblical norms of a properly ordered church. That the men are to lead in prayer, lifting up their holy hands. That the women are to be modestly dressed, ready to learn, and submissive. And so we have this example of order within the church gathering, and now we get into our text this morning, and Paul is going to give the qualifications for an overseer, or what we might call an elder or a pastor. And so really, he's contrasting what these uh, false teachers had been doing in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and now he's giving the right order here in chapter 3. So obviously, the qualifications for a pastor would be someone who loves the truth, who desires to um, obey God's word. And so we go through these, and I want, as we go through these, I want us to have our minds uh, with this understanding. That Christ has established his church, and in doing so, he has established how and who will lead it. Christ is the head over all, but has by his good will and intention ordained men to lead the body. And so the head of all things is Christ, but he has given roles of leadership. And so as we see here in chapter 3, this list of qualifications, it's broken up into three types. You have personal qualifications, uh, family qualifications, and then church qualifications. And so the list of qualifications we'll be looking at today are going to be personal qualifications. So with that, let's get into our first one. Look at verse 2 with me. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. This could be also described as one who gives no ground for accusations. Uh, The Greek word here translated says one who cannot be laid a hold of. So we get this image of our mind to be above reproach is to be having an uh, example within our life where no one can grab a hold of some kind of scandal or controversy. You think of our current context, anytime you turn on the news, anytime you look anywhere to any media source, there's always controversy, controversy, controversy. All the headlines in the news outlet are scandal and controversy. We just spent a couple of months watching and peering into the inward lives of two famous actors. And it was all the rage. Everyone wanted to talk about this, this trial of these two actors. You couldn't go anywhere without seeing or hearing, did you hear about the update of this trial? Just this constant desire for controversy, this constant desire for scandal. Everyone wants to know the latest gossip. And so in this day of age, to be above reproach is something that seems so foreign and distant. Something that seems not to be desirous because controversy and scandal sells. To be above reproach is to be other than what this world would desire. And so Paul begins with this first qualification. 
Are you above reproach? So Paul begins for us this list, a way to discern whether the desire mentioned in verse 1 is followed up with a calling and sanctification required to hold the office. So notice that in verse 1 Paul says, if you desire, if anyone desires or aspires to the office, and now in verse 2 he says, okay, well if you desire or aspire for this, does your life uh, meet the qualifications? See, we can all desire for many things. But that doesn't mean we should or can fulfill those desires. Proverbs 19.2 gives us this wisdom. It says, Desire without knowledge is not good. And whoever makes haste with his feet misses his way. A glean on the wisdom found there. Desire without knowledge is not good. See, we must keep our desires in check as Christians, as followers of Christ, because oftentimes our desires can lead us into temptation and lead us into sin. And notice to the second part of that proverb, whoever makes haste with his feet misses his way. It gives this idea, this view of this man who has great passionate desires and instead of thinking through them, hastily makes his way towards them. And so I would begin with the desire to be an overseer, the desire to be an elder, should not be one that is taken hastily. It is one that should come with a, a full examination and a full consideration of the calling. Desire without knowledge is not good, and whoever makes haste with his feet misses his way. We are all aware of the deceitfulness of sin and our own evil desires. The flesh and its wickedness can take its desires and masquerade them as holy. You can see prosperity preachers who claim to be for Christ and yet all they're doing is raking in the money. So the flesh can take that which is holy and make it not. The one who desires to be an overseer must take heed of these qualifications. Examine them. Know them. For these are the qualifications of God for the shepherd of his sheep. We are not dealing with the realm of opinion here. This is what God demands of his elders. And that very thought should make us tremble. Those who desire the office of overseer. That very thought should cause us to not make haste, but to really truly examine and confirm the calling must be above reproach. This being the first qualification, I want us to spend some time here because I believe the rest of the qualifications fall under the umbrella of this one here. To be above reproach is to be seen as blameless. First and foremost, we're not going for some sort of sinless perfectionism. There's no one who was truly blameless but Christ our Lord. What this is getting at is a constant mark of repentance in one's life. To be above reproach is to have such a high moral standing that upon close examination there is no scandal or pervasive sin found in your life. Above reproach speaks of having a maturity about you that you are not prone to being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, as Paul says in Ephesians. To be above reproach is not something that you can just claim. I can't just come before you and say, I'm above reproach. I'm not going to let you examine anything. I'm just saying that that's what I am. I'm above reproach. Does that work? No. To be above reproach is something that has to be observable over time. Anyone can come into the walls of these, this church and show you a degree from a high, uh, high, highly recognized seminary. Anyone can walk into the walls of this church and tell you their years of service, all that they've accomplished in their work of ministry, and tell you that they're above reproach, but you will not know until you see their lives, until you witness with your own eyes their pattern of ministry, their pattern of walking with their family, their pattern of leading God's church. 
That's why I think that this is the beginning of one of the most important qualifications. To be above reproach is to have a life marked with repentance. To not have any pattern of disqualifying sin. No evidence of blatant sinful disregard. The elder is to be above reproach inside the walls of the church just as much as he is to be outside of it. Inside the church, the elder is to be above reproach. One who is not caught up in gossip or slander. One who not only knows Christ, but is actively pursuing to make Him known to those around Him. The desiring elder inside the church is one who must be able to utter the words of the Apostle Paul. Follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And in this consideration, in this examination of oneself, I think this is where most men will be weeded out from their desire if it is not from the Lord. Because it is here that you must recognize the weight of such a statement. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. That is an invitation to any and all to walk beside me all day, every day. It's quite easy to follow this and to say this when you step through the doors here at this building. Having prepared your words to speak of grace, having put on the good church face, It's easy to say, imitate me when we're inside these walls. It's all good and well, but when you leave this church building and go about your daily life, that is when you must be able to say, follow me as I follow Christ. As an overseer of the flock of the Lord Christ, you are the earthly model of holiness inside the body. The one who desires to be an overseer must also desire to have his life examined on the regular to be found without any marks that would bring shame to the Lord, his gospel, and his church. Men, if you desire to be an elder, know this, your actions inside the walls of the church and outside are going to be under a microscope. How often we hear of scandals surrounding pastors or found in reproach for some sort of moral failure. You ever notice too, it always seems to blow up quite bigger than any other scandal. Think of all the scandal that takes place in our own government here in this country, but if there's any foothold for the enemy to find a scandal within the church, it's going to blow up on national news. It's because this world hates Christ. And will seize any opportunity to point out the moral failings of any who call Christ Lord. And so that is what must be recognized for those that would desire to be in the office of overseer. Your life will be under examination. The enemy would love to find a foothold to bring a mark against the gospel of grace. So the life is to be above reproach within these walls. And life is to be above reproach outside of the walls of this church. And what that looks like is having a good standing within your community. Now we must understand this one to be taken in context. There's obviously going to be many who will be slanderous towards those who preach the message of of the gospel of grace. I know that we've experienced that out in uh, the town square of proclaiming Christ, proclaiming His gospel, and people will slander you and and say you're just a terrible, awful person and many more wicked things. So to be above reproach in our community is to be truthful, to speak the truth in love, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. They may deem the message of the gospel as hateful, but may your words and actions never be seen as such. Have a good conscience before the Lord, knowing that God gets to define what is hateful, not the community we find ourselves in. But again, to be above reproach in your community is to be known as a man of faith 
a man of prayer and a man of love for his neighbor. That this world would know us because of our love for one another. Another thing in considering these qualifications and considering this calling, the office of overseer is an office of leadership. To be a leader is to assume that the lens be focused upon you. The very word leader implies that you are going to have people that will follow you. Being above reproach is fighting at all cost for moral purity in your life so that as not to bring shame to the name of Christ. It is for this reason Paul gives a list of qualifications for the office and not a list of duties. And so I know that you might be thinking to yourself, okay, well, that sounds like something I don't want anything to do with. This constant examination, this constant of being above reproach. You might also be saying to yourself, well, what does that have to do with me? I'm a lay person. I'm a woman. I'm not going to be an overseer. I'm not going to be a pastor. Christian, know this this morning, dear saint, know this, beloved, that you as a follower of Christ are to be above reproach as well. The office of elder, uh, elder, the office of pastor, yes, is going to be more in the limelight, is going to have more of a focus, but you this morning have been called to be above reproach. You this morning, proclaiming Christ as Lord, should be willing to say that same statement, imitate me as I imitate Christ. What is your standing within your community? What is your standing within your workplace? Do people know that you are a Christian? Do you act as such? Do you desire to be a good witness? So these lists of qualifications at times will overlap with what it is to be a Christian. What it is to follow the Lord. And so it's with this qualification, this first one of being above reproach, that we get to our next one. Look there with me in verse 2. The husband of one wife. The literal translation here is a one-woman man. And so there's a few things I want us to address here with this one. First and foremost, it is first uh, affirming for us, once again, this title is for men only. The role of husband can only be a man, no matter what this silly world would try to say. Again, I never thought in my life that we would see a day when that would be up for dispute. Um, but that's where we're at. That's the context we live in. That's the culture we're in. And so Paul says here, a, a husband of one wife. There are people within the body of Christ today who would try to begin to argue the plain meaning here. There are arguments that I've heard that say what Paul really is getting at here is just a person who is faithful in a monogamous relationship. They would argue that it could read a wife of one husband. Other arguments I've heard is this is only for the women in Ephesus. We reject this notion, saints. We reject it on the authority of God's word that plainly states that I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over men. And I hope you don't see me as pushing this argument as some kind of men versus women or some kind of chauvinistic talking point. That's not my goal here. It's recognizing, understanding that God as creator has the right to ordain the roles of men and women. And that in doing so, he has done so beautifully. That in his perfect will and design of man and woman, he has created specific roles for each. This is not to go against, or not to just be uh, controversial for controversy's sake. This is just plainly what the Bible teaches. We must recognize the beauty in the distinction of the sexes. God has created specifically each one of us for a purpose. And as creator, he has the right to define those. So back to this qualification, a husband of one wife, a one-woman man, is a call to consider your marriage as the greatest blessing bestowed upon you apart from your relationship with Christ. 
that you are to love your wife as Christ loved the church. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 5 talks of marriage as the profound mystery that points to Christ and the church. And so the man desiring to be an overseer must recognize that his marriage is to be closely guarded at all costs. That God does not just call a man to be an elder for doctrinal purity, but for moral purity as well. Again, there's these countless stories of solid biblical teachers who taught with doctrinal purity and who were found to be cheating on their own wives, leading to a permanent disqualification. I remember one a few years back now, a pastor who I used to listen to quite frequently and even visited his church one time when I was out of town. One of those pastors that just preached so eloquently and with just this beautiful doctrinal purity. Someone that I was like, aspire to be like in his preaching methodologies and the way he taught. Someone that was very instrumental in my own uh, growth and faith. And you come to find out that he's been having a, a, a affair for years. He's been cheating on his wife for years. And as a believer, I was caught off guard by this. I thought, how could this man, who taught so well and was so gifted, fall so short? Again, the theology he taught helped me to grow in my faith, helped me to form my view of theology. And it was this huge shock when I found out. And by the grace of God, he stepped down and, and left, left the church. But the shock that I experienced, now consider the shame that was brought to Christ and His church by that act. That black mark that was left on that church because this man did not consider moral purity in his marriage. And so that's something we must wrestle with, we must grasp. If you desire this office of overseer, moral purity is just as important, if not more important, than doctrinal purity. The role of overseer is one of moral purity, and for those who are married, your marriage must be sacred to you. The first ministry is to your wife. Right theology will be of no use if your marriage is not seen as sacred, as something to be protected preserved, and sanctified. The Apostle Paul, again, in Ephesians 5, 28-29, says, In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So no one ever hated his own body, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Now again, saints, we're going into the realm, this is the standard for all husbands now that we are to love our wives in this way. But how much more this needs to be at the forefront of the mind for those who would seek to be an elder in the church. Because as an elder in the church, the church will be looking to your marriage as the example of godliness. It will be your marriage that is looked to first as the real life example of what is taught in Scripture. It will be your marriage that people will reference Ephesians 5 to. It will be your marriage that people will reference uh, Christ's teaching of adultery to. A one-woman man is one who will at all costs keep the marriage bed sacred, that his eyes and heart would be set upon his bride and his bride alone. His affection would be for her alone. His time and devotion would be for her first and foremost, thus showing the beauty of Christ's love for his church through the image of of his love for his wife. And so I have this question, how could we ever consider to lead the bride of Christ if we do not first desire to lead our own bride? The qualifications here come with this examination. Again, not only by yourself, but those around you. As the church body here, you have as congregational-led church, you have given 
the opportunity to raise up elders amongst us. And so your examination of those who would desire this office is important. I think the two main starting places would be this first one of, of being above reproach and the second one, what does the marriage life look like? So now we get to our next qualifications. It says now, uh, be sober-minded and self-controlled. And so we see this word and this use of sober-minded. It's found throughout the New Testament and is used to describe a mind that is first off sober in the sense of not drunk or high on drugs. This is easy to reconcile in 1 Corinthians 6. It gives us a list of sins that will send a soul to hell. And drunkenness is one of those sins. So an overseer cannot be a drunk. And Paul will get into that further in the next verse. But this word sober-minded is also used to describe a mind not intoxicated by worldly thought and influences. This would be seen in the counterpart here in 1 Timothy in the first chapter. We look at those false teachers and their minds were intoxicated by myths, by genealogies and vain discussions. So to be sober-minded is to have the mind of Christ. Paul, speaking of this mindset, had this to say in Philippians 2, verses 2-5. through He says, Complete my joy by being of this same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus. And so we see Paul giving this example, this same mind, this unity of thought within the body. This thought that is focused upon Christ, that is humbled towards others, that is seeing others as more significant than yourself. Paul would later write in Romans 12, 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable acceptable and perfect will of God. And so we see throughout the, the scriptures this renewal of your mind, this desire to be sober-minded, and that is to take the mind of Christ, to have the gospel permeating through your thoughts, through your prayer life, through your discussions. How often do we find ourselves in vain discussions of things that have no true eternal matter? And so the sober-minded man is not drug into ridiculous controversies or petty gossips, To be sober-minded is to put your mind in check and realize that what you dwell on will permeate in in how you act in this life. A mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, as we know, but the mind of of the Spirit submits to God and has life and peace. So to be sober-minded is to strive to seek the glory of God in all things. A sober mind is slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to anger. It is a mind that meditates on the beauties of Christ and His Word. The sober mind is aware of a great foe as well. This great enemy of ours, the devil. And is actively on guard of every wandering thought, knowing that the thought of lust is an act of adultery according to Christ. Knowing that the thought of hatred, Christ would say, is murder in our hearts. And so the sober mind is active It's actively pursuing meditation on who Christ is. Actively pursuing to read and be thinking of the Word of God. Sober-minded is an active process. 1 Peter 1.13 says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action. See the active that's taking place? It's not just a a passive to be sober-minded. It's active. Preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded sets your hope fully on the grace. Track with me for a second. Peter says, prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded. And what are we thinking of? What are we preparing our minds for? Well, we're setting our hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So to be sober-minded is to prepare our minds for action. 
to set them on the hope of Jesus Christ, and then to seek the revelation of Jesus Christ through his scriptures. And so as an overseer, as an elder, you are called to be sober-minded. And then it says self-controlled. If you're sober-minded, then what follows from that is being self-controlled. The sober mind is far less likely to act out of control. I think we've all experienced that person in our lives that don't really want to be around because they have no self-control. That person who overreacts and just blows up a situation. The person who just drinks to a blackout drunk. They become incontrollable. Even you may know the person who just gambles away their savings. Those aren't the type of people you want to surround yourself with. So it's not a fun situation to be around someone who has no self-control. Recognizing, too, what Paul is getting at here, that self-control is a recognition of the, one of the forms of governance that God has given to us. So God has given us the ability to have self-control by the Spirit. And so this qualification of self-control is if you can't govern yourself, then what right do you have governing the body of Christ? Proverbs 25, 28 says, A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. So I'd say sober-mindedness and self-control going hand in hand. The mind that is sober will be able to control itself. Then we get to Respectable and hospitable. Respectable means that being regarded as good, proper, or correct. Again, the man who is above reproach will be respectable. He will also be hospitable. So this word hospitable here for the overseer, those that desire that, is the heart of the elder is one of service. The word hospitable here means a lover of strangers. To be hospitable is to make your resources available to strangers. We'll make accommodations to spend time with them. Make accommodations to spend time with people. So get that and, and understand that too. Is We aren't called to just live in our little Christian ghettos here. This isn't just our little place that we come to and this is all we're called to is this building right here. We've been called to go out into this world to be a lover of strangers. Sit and think with me that for a moment. I know it's difficult for us. Some of us might have social anxieties or be more of an introvert, but God has called us to go out and talk to our neighbors, to go out and greet those that we don't know and to bring this gospel of hope. You know, I think about uh, just this contrast between Southern Oregon and where I grew up in, in Southern California. Uh, in Southern California, we grew up with, everyone knew each other. All our neighborhoods, like all the neighbors knew each other. And I don't know if this is like where you guys are at in Oregon, but now that I'm here in Oregon, it's like none of my neighbors want to talk. They, everyone's in their own house. You just, you mind your P's and Q's. No one's open to conversation. I mean, you're lucky if you get a smile and a wave from your neighbor. And so recognizing that, we're, we're in an area that is not really open to being hospitable too. I mean, you can offer all kinds of things. It's hard to get people to even show up. It's hard to get, a, a, like I said, a smile or a wave. I mean, I have it all the time. I'll be driving down my block and smiling and waving to neighbors, and it's like hard-pressed to get one to smile or wave back. So we live in an area that it's very uh, difficult to uh, be hospitable, but that doesn't neglect our requirement to be hospitable, to go out and be a friend to strangers, to be a lover of strangers. So now we get to the last qualification of this verse, and it says, able to teach. Now this is a unique qualification of the elder, that they be able to teach the Word of God. So notice how Paul has just given us this entire list of moral qualifications before he comes to this one, teaching. It's as if Paul is saying to us, your life must be in order morally before you even begin to think of teaching God's word to his sheep. 
Matthew 12, 34 says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we've been given this list of moral uh, qualifications. We know, saints, that what's in our hearts is, again, as the, the gospel says, is what comes out. All the right theology and sound doctrine will be of no use for the kingdom if the one who teaches it is not morally upright. So we get to now this, so we get to this now after having to examine our personal life, having to examine our marriages, our minds, our standing in the community and the household of God. Check those areas first, then examine whether you have been called to teach. Uh, Charles Spurgeon had this to say about teaching. He says, I am content to live and die as the mere repeater of scriptural teaching, as a person who has thought out nothing and invented, and invented nothing, but who concluded that he was to take the message from the lips of God to the best of his ability and simply to be a mouth for God to his people. The teacher desires to speak what God has said. It seems like such a simple statement, but this truly is where most of the perversion within the church takes place. When the elder takes it upon himself to come up with something new. When the elder takes it upon himself to overreach the bounds that Scripture has laid. So I really appreciate this view that Spurgeon gives. He wants to be a person who has thought out nothing and invented nothing, but simply gives the message from the lips of God. To recognize as an overseer that what you speak is not your own brilliant crafting, but the gift from the Holy Spirit. As Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun, and so thus God's word is eternal and forever. There's nothing to be added to it or taken away from it. The teacher or the preacher is merely standing on the shoulders of giants, so to speak. So those who desire to teach must first have been taught by the Master. Jesus, throughout the Gospels, is often referred to as teacher. And so thus, if you desire to teach, you must be taught by your Master. You must be committed to His teachings. To study the Word in such a way as to be able to give an answer of the Gospel. To study the Word with a desire to give instruction to those whom you've been called to shepherd. And being careful and sober-minded in your study. I believe one of the most sobering verses in all of Scripture for those who desire to teach is James chapter 3, verse 1. He says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. And we know that James is not talking about uh, a, a judgment of, as in losing your salvation, but there is some ambiguity there of what this judgment looks like. Uh, some would say it's you know, lesser uh, eternal rewards, um, but nonetheless, that warning is there in the text. Not many of you should become teachers because you will be judged with greater strictness. It's no, small, it's no small thing to speak on God's behalf to his sheep. And so the elder must always pay careful attention that when he steps into the pulpit and brings forth the word of God, he is no longer speaking on his own accord. He's speaking as from God. Again, no man ought to begin to teach until he has been taught and reminded of the fear of the Lord. There's no trivial matter teaching God's word. The very souls of men are at stake. Paul, giving us a contrast in Titus 1 of these qualifications, says in verse 9, He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So this is Paul's qualification of elders in first or Timothy 1 9. So notice there in the progression of Timothy or Titus 1 9, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as he has been taught. And then what comes from that is he may be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine and rebuke those who contradict it. The study and application of God's word in his own life is what comes first, first, to be taught by the Master. Psalm 25, verse 4 says, make me, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me 
your paths. Then, having been taught, your heart may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. I think this is what is very important for us to recognize, church, is that the knowledge of doctrine does nothing if it's not put into practice. Right doctrine is to lead to right devotion. And so this is something that goes beyond teaching just for the sake of knowledge. The other teacher is to teach in such a way that the outcome is not head knowledge, but heart knowledge. To lead the body in devotion and adoration of Christ. That's why the moral standards have been set prior to this qualification. Then we come to this Next part of that qualification in Titus. Rebuke those who contradict sound doctrine. So the overseer as teacher does not just preach the word and teach the sheep, but his ministry is also one of guarding the flock from false teaching. It's this dual action taking place by way of teaching what is sound and rebuking what is an error. I often use the analogy of counterfeit money that uh, bank tellers and those who deal in Numerous cash transactions are trained in how to spot fake money by examining the real thing over and over until they know every minute detail of the real currency. So to the men who have been called to teach in the church must be so tethered to the Lord and His Word that any falsehood that would spring up would in a moment be seen as the fraud that it is. To teach the flock of God is desire the spiritual health and well-being of the uh, body of Christ to desire that the body would feast upon Christ's word and have their fill, to lead in such a way that the word of God is dignified and magnified each and every time that it is presented. This is not a call to be the perfect preacher. This isn't a call to be the perfect public speaker. Rather, it is a call to be devoted to the love of God and his word and a love to teach what is found in it. This will be evident when you open your mouth and speak of him who is gracious and glorious. A faithful and sound preacher will do much for the kingdom. So I'm not sure if we'll get to verse 3, but as we come to a close this morning, I want us to go back to our question that we began with of what is a pastor? What is an elder? A pastor is a man who has been given the desire to lead the body of Christ. It is a man who upon examination is found above reproach in his moral character within the body and his community. A pastor is a man who is not fraught with scandal is a man who, if he is married, has sought in all ways to uphold the sacred vows that he has made with his bride. A man who has only eyes for his wife, just as Christ has loved the church. It is a man who has made it a habit to be of sober mind and self-controlled. One who is not pushed around by controversies or tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. A pastor is a mature man, able to teach the word, for he has been taught by the word. He makes it his aim to seek the master always before opening his mouth before the flock. He seeks to watch over the flock and guard them from wolves. And again, I want to give this clarification and this hope for you that you don't just toss to the side what has been spoken today because you're not a man or you don't desire to be an elder. Because these qualifications, these attributes are wise to behold as a follower of Christ. I hope that you would desire to be above reproach in your church body here and also in your community. I hope and pray that you would desire, if you are married, to love your wife or love your husband as yourself. This call to be above reproach is for each and every one of us. If we claim that Christ is Lord in our lives, then we are to be a reflection of His grace and His mercy. We are to be a reflection of the transforming power of the Gospel. 
Romans 12, 8 says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Christian, that is your call, to live peaceably. Now, our gospel is offensive. It will cause dispute. It will cause people to have frustrations and anger towards you. But your goal, your aim is to live peaceably with them. Second thing to recognize, again, as a part of the body of Christ, it is our duty to raise up elders and overseers. It is our goal to make more churches, to raise up more leaders within the church. And to do that, we must know the qualifications, we must study them, and be willing to put potential elders under the microscope of inspection. We must be willing to love a potential elder more than we love comfort in our own lives. It's not a comfortable thing to confront someone. It's not a comfortable thing to examine someone. It's, sometimes it's not even comfortable to ask how someone's doing with the intention of getting an answer besides good or fine. To desire to raise up elders is to desire to be intentional in your relationship with those that are around you. A desire to seek their well-being and also to affirm the qualifications in their life. In this day and age, I can say that I hope that we become an affirming church, that we affirm God's word and his qualifications for those who lead it. This church has the opportunity to raise up leaders and we must study these qualifications. In a time when every other thing would seem to want to affirm that which God hates, let's, uh, let us affirm that which God has said. We are to, for the sake of the health of the body, examine those who would desire to take the role within the church. Paul has given us quite the list of things to be on the lookout for, but he has given us a list. And lastly, saints... We've been given a list of items and things to be in prayer for over our own pastor here. The enemy is greatly pleased to cause a minister to fall into public sin. It is a pleasure of the, de uh, the devil to see the gospel marred. And so I'd ask each and every one of you to consider these qualifications and commit yourself to prayer for the pastor of this church. That God, by his grace and mercy, would guard his heart and protect him from the works of the devil. That we would, as a church, examine these qualifications and see them as a prayer list. And that we would be praying to seek to raise up elders beyond this. So church, join me in praying as we close.